welcome to the Apartment Investor Pro Podcast, where we talk about how to be a more successful multifamily investor with a focus on using technology to boost your business. And now your host, Todd Heitner. Welcome to Episode 7 of the Apartment Investor Pro Podcast. Our topic today is build, scale, and run a successful syndication business. My guest today is Ellie Perlman. Earlier in her career, she worked as a commercial real estate lawyer and later as a high-end property manager, gaining great experience in real estate investment. Today, she's the founder and CEO of the multifamily investing firm, Blue Lake Capital. She also leads a mentoring program, helping multifamily syndicators to build and scale their business. And that is the topic I'll be discussing with her today. She's gonna share tons of great tips, including how to build your syndication business from the ground up, what you as the business owner should do yourself and what you should outsource. She'll also talk about her philosophy on hiring and firing. So let's get right into the interview. So thanks so much for joining me today, today, Ellie. How are you today? I'm doing great, Todd. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, great. Glad to, glad to have you here. And so I thought today we'd talk about the business side of things with syndication, um, not the you know, technical aspects of doing a syndication, but the business side of it. Uh, a lot of people are maybe coming from a background where they had a job. And so, you know, running, doing a syndication um, is kind of a new thing, like the business side of it. Uh, and then as you start to grow that um, and scale, that's a lot of, for many people uncharted waters. So I thought we'd uh, ask you about that a little bit. So what would you say, like, where should people start with building their business? Um, are you talking about building a any business or specifically for syndication? Well, let's let's start with any business, I guess. <laughs> we'll do that first. with any. Yeah, I would say you know it's the beginning is always challenging because you want to understand first and foremost, you know what the business is and what you're trying to get and what the goals are. And I think starting from the end, starting from understanding what the goals are, can really help understand what resources you need, how many people you need to hire or partner. And when you're coming from a W-2 background, it's, it, it can be challenging because you don't always have enough money to start hire a team. So how do you do that? You know, that, that's, uh, that's one of the things that I've been dealing with when I started, um, you know, syndicating. So, and I think it's, it's a good question because even a syndication is a business first and foremost. Um, and so first step would be to understand the goal. What are you trying to get? Are you trying to get just an additional income, you know, in addition to your W2 job, which I've seen a lot of syndicators, you know, begin or a lot of business owners begin this way where they say, you know what, I like the security and the surety of, <clears throat> sorry, getting, you know, this check every two weeks, but I want to do something else. Um, but I can just cut my, you know, my income uh, right now. So I'm going to do it on the side. And it does make sense on one hand. On the other hand, there's a limit to where your business, you know, how fast you can grow and how much money you can make if you're dedicating, you know, part of your time to building your business. So if you're willing to take the risk, I would say, let's do it. Everyone is in a different position um, in life when they, when they think about starting a business. But the, the very first thing is to understand what is your goal. And when you understand the goal, you know, okay, am I, as I mentioned before, do I want to create an additional income? And in that case, maybe you don't need other people. You can do it, you know, by yourself. Or do you want to grow and become you know, a million dollar company, a billion dollar company. And knowing that can really help you reverse engineer and understand, okay, what do I need to do today or this year in order to hit that, this goal in 10 years, for instance? Yeah, that makes sense. And so um, do you recommend someone like fairly early on registering an entity like an LLC or something like that? Or like at what point do you think uh, they should think about that? You know, you can, you can create an LLC. It's not, you know, it's, it's not one of the first things that I would do um, because it takes time until you actually get, you know, have any income. Um, you can do that. And then, uh, I mean, you can use an online service. It's not very expensive. The only caveat is that sometimes as you think about the business and as you understand the goals and the, you know, the branding, you would 
you might want to rebrand it so you can have an LLC, but then, you know, you can at, update it as doing business as DBA. So if you have, for instance, a company called, you know, high performance LLC, but then you think that, wait a minute, I actually want to position, you know, I want to create a different branding, then you can base basically update the, the, the brand name, but, um, it's not expensive. You can do it. Um, especially if you are going to have an income right away, or if you want to present something, you know, on your website or anywhere else that you go. So, I mean, it doesn't hurt, but I wouldn't focus too much on it. Yeah. I, I can see where it, it kind of makes sense to think through things and be sure of kind of the direction you want to go maybe before taking that stuff. Cause you could end yeah. up doing a lot of work that you have to redo later if you change the direction. So yeah, that makes sense. And so what are some, what would you say some different elements of running a business that a syndicator should be aware of? Uh, maybe some things that they're often get overlooked or maybe not thought about. I think one of the things that um, new syndicators do is focus on the next deal and not focus on building this as a business. And what I mean by that is that when you begin, you know, when you start, you can focus on, okay, I just need to get one deal. So I underwrite every deal. Um, I also create my own content and, you know, try to bring investors to my website and, and I'm also going to schedule the meetings with them because I just want to get the next deal. And I just want to make sure that I have enough capital to close the deal. A different approach and a better approach for, in my opinion, would be to say, this is the six months or the 12 months plan. I need to get someone to help me build my online presence and I need someone to help, let's say, underwrite the deals. And I'm going to start making, you know, building relationships with broker and I'm going to be the one talking with investors, but I need those people around me to help me build that. And so, and think about it as a company, what is the thing that I have to do that nobody else can do? Because you know, writing an article, every, not maybe not everyone, but a lot of people can. I can pay for someone to do that and it's not expensive. Um, schedule meetings, run numbers. People can do that for me. The things that in my business that I cannot be replaced or it's very hard to replace me is the relationship part. So investors want to talk with the syndicators um, themselves. Broker, the brokers want to know who they're selling the property for too. So you know, basically finding, you know, those areas where you want to focus and outsourcing or, or partnering. If you can pay people um, to do the, the work, you can find someone who can do that without the upfront pay for a piece of, you know, of the equity. And so that's how you think about it as a business. And then every part of the business, create the process and automate it. So think, okay, what are, you know, all the steps that are needed to be done to get this thing you know, done. So for instance, how do I get a deal? I need to outsource to go to the website XYZ and outsource the deal. I need to underwrite it. Then, uh, you know, do kind of a quick underwriting, then have a, a call with the seller, then talk with the PM. So write down, and that's what I did. I wrote down every, on, on the whiteboard, I wrote down every part of the process. And it's true for every business. You got to understand what, what are the different functions in the company or, you know, in, in whatever trade, whatever you do and figure out where you want to position yourself and what you want to outsource or like, like I said, hire or partner. And within each category, build the different steps from A to Z, from start to finish. So it's easier for anyone else who's not you to understand how to do things and then try and automate it as much as you can by using softwares out there and tools and processes um, so you can get a lot more done. Yeah, that makes sense. I found too, like going through that process, well, you know, creating a process um, helps you even while, while you're doing it because you have to think through every step and then yep. make sure things are done at the right time. And then even while you're doing it yourself, if you have a process to follow, it's not don't get into a situation and realize, oh, I should have had this done already and I don't have it done. And, um, yeah. But then, like you said, you can easily pass that off to someone else, um, make it as simple as possible to just you know, get, get it off your plate on, you know, and let somebody else focus on it. And, and so what would you suggest as far as like when to hire someone? Because like you said, there's kind of that challenge, that, that point where um, maybe there's not enough, it, it doesn't feel like there's enough income coming in to, to justify hiring someone, but at the same time, you need to, to be able to move the business forward. So any thoughts on that? Yeah. And you know what? I, I took a risk when I started, um, you know, my company and I said, 
who's the first hire, where do I need help the most? And for me, it was on the admin side, just um, help me. You know, I, I used to write my own articles at first and I needed someone to help me post them on social media, circulate them on social media so it will grab investors' attention, schedule meetings with investors. And so that's the, my first hire was actually an admin. Um, and, you know, I use Upwork where you have people from either the U.S., you can hire them for, you know, 10 to $15 an hour. Or if you're on a, on a tighter budget, then you can hire people from, you know, the Philippines or India, and they have, you can find someone for $5 an hour. How good they are, I don't know. Um, some of them are decent. Um, so y- you can, you know, do either way, either hire locally or internationally. And you can say, hey, I'm going to allocate seven hours, you know, um, a week and I'm going to pay someone $7, let's say they're from the Philippines or or $10 an hour. So, you know, $70 a week, it's not a huge budget. Um, and, and, And so that's basically how you can start, you know, hiring just the, the, the one thing you hate doing the most and, and takes the most out of your time because every minute I'm, I, I spent on scheduling, you know, in, a call with investors, that was another minute I could look at another deal or, or speak with someone um, that can help me, you know, um, either bring capital or, you know, by investing in my deals or um, help me underwrite a deal or look at a deal or, or manage the asset or do something else that brings a lot more value. Because for my business, it wasn't the best use of my time to do the administrative, you know, tasks. So um, that's one way of doing it. Another way, if you say, you know what, I absolutely have no money, uh, which in syndication will be a little bit challenging because just the down payment, you know, you need to come up with a substantial amount. Well, not for the down payment right away, but um, you can take, you can, you know, raise money from investors for that, but just the um, hard money, which, you know, could be 25,000, could be a hundred thousand, could be $200,000 as long as you're under contract. Um, so you do need to have some money, but assuming you don't have money at all, you can basically find people and say, Hey, can you, if you know how to underwrite, and I've seen it being done before where you have one pe- person who says, I can bring capital. I have investors. I have the connections. I have the online presence, whatever it is. Um, I don't, have I either don't like or don't know how to underwrite deals. And so the other guy would say, I'm really good at that. I know how to underwrite how to underwrite it. Let's team up and then we can split whatever profits, I don't know, 50, 50, 60, 40, whatever it is. So you can find people who are able to do that. Um, I've also seen structures where there were two partners or one partner and they basically they didn't like to underwrite. So they said, hey, Mr. Underwriter, why don't you underwrite deals for free for us? And in returns, when we close a deal, we're going to give you, I don't know, 2% or 3% of the general partnership, basically from whatever we're making, we're going to give you a small piece. Um, and some people really like that. Um, and it, it, it works. So money shouldn't, you know, stop anyone from starting a business. There's always, you know, a way to work around it. That's how startups, you know, how they start. I mean, they don't, there's not a lot of money. And even if they, they raise money from VCs and from uh, investors, they don't have enough to pay nice salaries and they're still able to attract good talent. And they do that by uh, making them feel that they have some sort of, um, you know, meaning and excitement, you know, they build excitement around a brand and, and also they give them some equity. So people know, okay, I'm not taking a big check today but I believe in this company and this, you know, the equity that I have can turn into a lot of money if we're successful. Okay. That makes sense. I think another challenge too, that some of those people run into with hiring people is the the idea that they could do it better in themselves. You know, like I don't want somebody else to Mm. do it because I feel more comfortable doing it. I I don't think it'll get done right if I pass it off. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a trap that many, many business owners uh, need to deal with. And, and it, it was something that I also uh, had to struggle. You know, I was struggling with at the beginning, even if it's true. Well, some part of it is true for two reasons. One, you're the most, um, 
you know, as a business owner, you are the most motivated person on the team many times. And also you think you do it best because you do it the way that it's built in your mind and anything, any deviation from that could look like it's not the best way of execution. Um, you can do it, but you're going to be working in your business, not on your business. And at some point you have to let go. You have, for me, the moment that I let go of that and I said, I'm okay with things being done 90% and not 100% the way that I envision them, they still have to be good. I mean, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's not going to be quality, um, but it's not exactly how I want it. Then this is where my business actually took off. I mean, you just got to let people in your team, you know, you got to give them the, the autonomy to do that. Um, and and it, you have to free up your time. If you want to do, you know, it's, I read um, Robert Kiyosaki's, um, you know, obviously Rich Dad Poor Dad book and then the four quadrants. And actually I like the four quadrants more because it makes, the book makes a distinction between the four quadrants, um, basically four types of occupations or states where people are. So the first one is a W2, that's an employee. Then you have, you have an employee and then on the other side, you have investor. And most people want to jump from employee to an investor, but um, you basically have employee, self-employed, business owner, and investor. And usually you go from employee to business owner or from employee to self-employed and then to investor because the self-employment or the business owner ownership will generate enough cash so you can start investing. However, one of the things that resonated with me when I read the book is that, you know, the, the author makes this distinction between business owner and self-employed. And he says many, he said that basically many people are getting confused between the two. They think that if, you know, they're consultants or they're doing everything uh, in the business that they, they own a business. But if you go on vacation for six months and the business dies, then you don't own a business. You are self-employed and it's very, very different. And you can scale when you understand the difference. And when you move to, um, a bit, the business owner, you know, bucket. So it's, it's the same, the same thing, you know, is applied here. Yeah, of course it will be perfect the way you want it, but you're always going to stay self-employed. It's never going to be, you're never going to make the jump to a business owner. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and so when you are hiring somebody and you're, you're looking at people, obviously the skills they have are important, but what other things do you look for in people, like maybe traits and things that, um, and how does that compare to maybe them having the skills? Um, uh, so hopefully that makes so, sense. So, yeah. So um, I would say the number one thing that I'm looking for is a cultural fit, especially with a small company, you know, one person without the right attitude that doesn't fit basically, you know, we can feel the waves, um, of the, the mismatch very much, you know, much more than a company with 200 employees and one or two that are not really a good fit. So cultural fit, you know, it, it took me time to understand what, what I stand for in the business arena and who are the people that I need by my side. Um, you know, hardworking, humble, taking ownership, you know, have can do attitude, um, not, you know, yes, men's or yes, women. And that's what I'm looking for when I'm hiring someone, because it has to match because we're such a small company. Um, and I've hired people before that did not fit the bill. And that was a mistake on my part because I didn't put enough emphasis on the cultural fit and naturally it didn't work because they're just, it, it, I don't think they were happy and I don't think we were happy with them. Mm -hmm. And so it was just, it went, it boils down to, um, before I even look at any skill or how smart you are, or which school you came from, it's all about the fit. If you have the right spirit, if you have, um, you know, the right values, otherwise it's just not going to work. Yeah, I agree. Cause the, the skills can be taught or, or learned or improved on, but if the personality doesn't fit, it really does create a problem in the business. So I yeah. think that's kind of an area too, where you, you want to have that defined, like what, what is important to me? Like what are those core values that, so you have something to measure people against. And yeah, so when absolutely. I, and so like in, you, you mentioned you hired someone before that wasn't a good fit. So how do you handle that situation? Like when and how do you let somebody go or maybe fire them uh, when they aren't a good fit? Let's take a moment to thank our sponsor. And when we return, Ellie talks about business management, how to manage stress, and she explains the subtle difference between marketing and branding. So stay tuned for that. 
Do you have a website that gives you credibility and captures leads? ApartmentsInvestorPro.com can help you get a professional website today. Typically, building a professional website can be a real pain, taking thousands of dollars and months of your time. One syndicator said it took him 10 months on his own. Another had to go through three different companies before getting something usable. ApartmentInvestorPro.com makes it quick and painless. All the design and content is already created. With 15 years of experience building websites for investors, ApartmentInvestorPro.com gives you peace of mind and lets you focus your time on finding deals and investors. These powerful websites capture contact information from your potential investors. You can even automate the follow-up process. No more letting good investor leads fall through the cracks. Save 10% on your website by going to apartmentinvestorpro.com and using coupon code PODCAST. When and how do you let somebody go or maybe fire them uh, when they aren't a good fit? You know, I always say be slow. Well, I actually did not say it. I read it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Be slow to hire and quick to fire. I wasn't doing that. I think sometimes I was definitely, you know, quick to, to hire, which was my mistake. Um, but when you see that um, other team members start feeling uncomfortable, when I get feedback from other team members, hey, you know, this is, that was our interaction with, you know, so-and-so. And I feel that I don't enjoy working with that person or their manager is not, does not enjoy working with that person. I mean, it's, I, I really try not to fire. I didn't fire a lot of people um, or let go, but in such a small company, there's no room to keep, you know, someone who's not a good fit. And, and unfortunately, yeah, it, it does happen. It's, it's a business and, and, you know, it is what it is, but you don't really know when is the right time. There's no like formula. You just feel, you know, if, if I'm for me, if I'm not dreading, but if I, I feel uncomfortable working with them and I don't really want to meet with them and, you know, I, I don't have, you know, that excitement or that uh, connection, I think that's when it's, it's time to let go. Yeah. You kind of get that feeling that they're kind of dragging the whole team. Yeah. Back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. And so do you have any tools or anything used to manage, let's say like projects that are going on and maybe even the, the team or, you know, what people are working on? Yeah. So I like Airtable, um, which is, it's a free software and it's, um, it's kind of based on Excel spreadsheets, but it, it looks, it looks like a software. Uh, I, it, it, it's really great. So I use that to kind of track who's doing what. Um, I'm not micromanaging, but just the high level projects of who's, you know, who's, who's involved with which projects. And then we're basically uh, using an OKR software as well, which is objectives and key results. Um, and it's basically, these are the five or four uh, top goals for the company this year. And okay, th these are the objectives. These are the what. Now, each objective has multiple key results, which is kind of the how. Okay, for instance, we want to purchase a thousand units, you know, in 2020. That's the objective. So how are we going to do that? It could be hiring another analyst. It could be partnering with other syndicators so we can, you know, do more deals. It could also be, uh, you know, th there, there are multiple ways of, of getting there. And so once we break it down, um, then we say, okay, in order, for instance, to hire another analyst, I need, you know, somebody's help to, to find candidates to interview them, for instance. Um, and so this way, everyone can see what are the goals for the company. And it brings everyone kind of, you know, to be on, on the same page. And even if you're a solopreneur and you have no employees, just, you know, having that exercise is very helpful. It keeps you focused. Before we use that, um, we used to try and do all kinds of projects um, at the same time. And right. And now when we see it, we say, wait a minute, is it smart to continue working on something where, you know, we can see what's the, the most important objectives for the company. So we need to focus on this. We're going to put everything else or some of the projects on hold because these are distractions. We'll get to them, but maybe, you know, a quarter from now or two quarters from now. 
And just focusing on this has brought us tremendous, you know, just amazing results. Yeah. It definitely helps to have that focus. Yeah. 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 Okay. And kind of a, maybe seems unrelated, but like another question is how important do you think it is to have exercise and like taking care of your physical health when it comes to running a, a business? Uh, tremendously important. I mean, it, you know, I try, I try to run maybe twice a week. Uh, I used to go to the, do, I mean, go to the gym or, or do Pilates or something every, you know, I would say four to five times a week. It's hard to make the time, but it does keep you, you know, focus. It lowers your stress levels because every own business owner, it doesn't matter how well the business is going, you're still going to be stressed out unless you're superhuman. And in that case, I want to know what's your secret. But uh, yeah, the, it's, it's extremely important because when you're not taking care of your health, you're less focused, you're less productive, your team feels it. And then, you know, what's the point? What's the point of really having a successful business if your health is deteriorating? If by the age, you know, when you're going to get to the age of 70, you won't be able to walk straight. I mean, what's the point of all of this? For me, it's, it's allowing me to live a certain lifestyle where I have, you know, time to spend with the people that I love, that I can take trips, that I can, I don't have to worry about the next check where it's coming from and, you know, don't have that, you know, discomfort and health is a big part of it. So if you do all that, you can be the richest person in the world and your health is not going to be great. And, you know, for me, it, it's just not worth it. Yeah. You're not going to enjoy it. So yeah. It doesn't mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know I found that to be true too. Like having that, having some consistent exercise helps you be more, I, I found it helps me to be a lot more productive. I get a lot more done yeah. energy, uh, which, you know, in the long run, you're, you're going to get more done. So it doesn't, yep. it doesn't make sense to sacrifice that for, you know, short term, you know, getting very true. Yeah. So maybe we could shift a little bit and talk about the brand side of, um, you know, building a, a brand with a business. Um, we probably all heard people talk about building a brand, but what does that mean to you? Or like, how would you define building a brand? Um, it's a very, very good question. I think building a brand for me is basically how my business and I'm specifically being perceived by other people. Um, and there are multiple ways of doing that. Um, you know, some of them is kind of reiterating your values over and over in different methods. And, you know, it could be for me, it's for instance, I'm very conservative. So I'm going to say that to investors when I'm speaking with them. Um, some of the blog posts that I, um, that I'm basically circulating on, on social media, that, that I circulate, sorry, on social media, talk about how to invest conservatively. It's something I talk about on, you know, social media and on podcasts. So that's kind of part of branding. And I think it's also making sure that people understand who you are and your story, if you're comfortable sharing. I think it's a, it's a big part of branding. Um, it's not just a fancy logo and amazing, you know, video clips and, you know, ads, very, you know, expensive ads running. This is not what I see as branding. Um, this is maybe marketing, but branding, maybe marketing is kind of, you know, look at us, this is what we do. And branding is, this is who we are. Um, so very, very two different things. So that's what I see as branding. That's why, you know, my website has my, has my um, I, I post my personal story. So I, you know, I came from nothing and um, I, I was struggling as, as, a, as a kid without, you know, growing up um, to a poor family and, and um, you know, cleaning synagogues when I was, you know, very little just to help my parents uh, make a living. So this is part of who I am. This is part of my brand, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's how I think about branding. Yeah. So who you are and then kind of weaving that into maybe every interaction really in some way that people have yeah. with your business. Yeah. So the content and, and um, all of that. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And so at what point do you think people should start thinking about their brand? Um, from the beginning, but I have to say that it takes time to find your voice because I think that your voice is your, should be your branding. It took me time to crystallize and, and, and understand exactly what I want to present. You know, I had a story and people say you have a very interesting, you know, story, but I didn't make the connection between that and my brand. Um, I was conservative in nature because I used to be a lawyer in my past life, but I didn't, it took me time to understand that you know what? Being conservative is part of my branding. It's part of my 
part of who I am as an investor. It takes time to find your voice, but I would say start working on your branding right away because it, it, you know, you can work the changes into the branding. Don't wait until you understand exactly what you stand for because it will evolve and you need to play around with it to get some feedback and see what works and what doesn't work. Um, but yeah, pretty early on, cause you want to set yourself apart, you know, almost in every industry, there are a lot of other competitors and it's a little bit tight. So standing out, that's what branding helps you do. And it's, it's about figuring out what's interesting or unique about you, your skills, the way you view the world. It could be an interesting life story. It could be the fact that, you know, maybe you used to be, I don't know, a ballerina or, or a soccer player or anything, you know, out of the ordinary, maybe you, you know, I, I don't know. It could be many other things that people can actually relate to. Find that. And if you don't have anything, you know, any, you know, very interesting hobbies or background, it could be maybe the way you view the world. Maybe you see it very differently and a lot of people can relate to that. Um, so just, you know, it, it, it's a process to find your voice, but uh, as long as you, you give yourself the ability um, to be vulnerable and to be out there, put yourself out there um, and experiment with marketing, um, you know, with different platforms and how to present who you think you are. Um, I, I, I would say that that's the way to go. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause it, otherwise, you know, they it just are super generic with everything. Then there's nothing for people to remember, but when they yeah. have something about you that they remember, they're like, Oh yeah, that's the, the person that does this or exactly. Um, yeah. So it helps people. Yeah. Stick in their mind. Um, Great. And so um, then maybe we could also shift a little bit toward the like time management and automation. We touched on that a little bit earlier, but um, you know, sometimes people are coming from a background where they're somebody else set their schedule for them, a, a job, for example, or maybe they're getting into their, you know, and they realize that they need a more effective strategy for managing their time to get everything done. Do you have any suggestions for effectively managing time? Um, yeah, one of the things that I've done, um, and I learned it from Gary Keller, the founder of Keller Williams, he, he wrote a great book called the one thing. So if you're out there, just, just go get the book. Cause it's amazing. But basically the bottom line is in order to grow and to manage your time better, you've got to focus on what really matters. Um, so take the four, you know, three or four hours of the day. I used to block them and work only on the things that I knew that were instrumental to my business, um, to my growth. So basically you, you kind of got to ask yourself, what is the one thing that by doing it, everything else is easier or, you know, I can basically eliminate, you know, many other tasks that I have. And so for me, for instance, the answer was underwriting deals. You know, it took me so much time and I spent all my time on it. I didn't have time to speak with investors. I didn't have time to really, um, you know, look at other deals on a strategic level. And so this is the one thing that I focused on. At first, I would only underwrite myself, which was a good exercise. And then I realized, okay, I need to find someone who can do it more effectively. And then the, sh I, the shift was, let's find someone who can underwrite. And so that's what this whole thinking process was helping me understand. So, and then it, it changes. And then it was, okay, the main focus is to find the next deal. Now, what do I do? So in the first three or four hours in the day, I would call brokers, fly out to, you know, Atlanta, for instance, and to, to Dallas to see the properties. And so I devoted a lot of time to basically uh, run the number, uh, sorry, not run the numbers, but review it with my underwriter, but build relationships with brokers so I can bring more deals. And so just blocking the, the time in the morning was very helpful for me because it forced me to focus on the most important things that could actually bring my business to the next level. And so do you, um, like during that time, do you kind of block out other things like email and your text messages and that kind of stuff? Uh, I, I wish I did. It, this is, uh, you know, very hard for me to do. Um, I know that some people do, if they can do it, you know, that's great. I, I didn't do it, but I was, I didn't have, um, kind of a running, you know, I, I do have a to-do list every day. Uh, you know, I have, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I have about seven or eight different things I need to get, you know, I need to do, but if I don't start doing them and, you know, if I don't start 
answering emails in those four or three hours. It's still coming in. I want to know if there's an emergency, but I don't mm -hmm. reply to them. I just focus on what I need to focus on. That was very helpful for me. Yeah. I can see where it helps to do the, those really, the most important thing first in the day, because it's pretty easy if you don't, yeah. if you put it off later in the day, it just doesn't get done. A lot of times it gets put off till yeah. tomorrow and then the next day. So yeah, it's good, good advice. And do you have any advice about um, like working from home versus maybe working from an office or something like that? Um, renting an office space? Um, I, I did both. It's, it really depends on, on your, your setup. I mean, right now during COVID, we don't have a lot of choice. Um, I mean, I work well in an office and, and also for my house. Um, yeah, I like to diversify and kind of, um, you know, my, uh, my surroundings. So I like to go to coffee shops every once in a while to just get out of the house because in COVID we're all working, you know, from, uh, from home. But even before COVID, I used to kind of combine working from home and working from my office. So, you know, many times... In my business, many times you're on the phone. Um, so just being in an office and interrupting everyone is not the best thing to do. And most of my team is remote anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it doesn't matter for me what one way or the other. I know that some of my employees have a noise canceling headphone so they can say focus. I don't have a lot of distractions at home. So, you know, it just, for me, it works great. Yeah, I, I, found, I, I can relate to what you said about having that variety, like having, you know, some days where you maybe work at home or the office, yeah. and then you go to a coffee shop or something. I found that yeah, because you know you're there for a certain purpose, like it helps you to kind of stay focused on that and you don't have the, you know, whatever other distractions you might normally have. So, yeah, good. And, um, and you kind of touched on this earlier, but we, about downtime, uh, how important do you think it is to have some downtime when you're, you know, where you can just kind of, uh, completely step away from the business for periods of time. Very hard to actually, not very hard to find a time. If you're your own boss, you can say, Hey, it's 7 PM. I'm going to stop working for like an hour, get dinner, and then maybe go back to it. Technically it's not challenging, but when you're there, just making sure that you are emotionally available to enjoy the downtime. I think that's the main challenge for most business owners because I find myself, you know, on vacation or, or, you know, having dinner or whatever I do still consumed by the business, still thinking about the business, still thinking about the one thing I need to do tomorrow, the email I forgot to send or anything else. And it's, it's, it's hard because when you have a business, I mean, the way the W2s are looking at business owners is that they have, they're making money. They have, you know, they have control over their time and, and they can do whatever they want. Technically it's true, but I can tell that I'm the most uh, demanding boss that I've ever had. <laughs> and um, I am working, I'm working the hardest that I've ever worked in my whole life, period. Sometimes I work until 1, 2 a.m. Sometimes I work until midnight. Sometimes just until, you know, 7 or 8 p.m. And it doesn't feel like work. I actually, I like it. I, I you know, I feel, you know, it's, it's uh, invigorating and exciting. But then sometimes it's also, you know, it takes a lot out of you. So finding the downtime, that's not the issue. But when I'm doing things other than work, I'm still thinking about work. So it's always in the back of your mind, even when you try to not think about it, it's very, very hard to completely erase it. You know, when you were W2, when I was a W2, I got into my car at 4 or 5 p.m. It was a tech company, so work was not very hard, at least not for me. Got into my car at 4 p.m. by 5, let's say I was home, you know, I live in LA, so it was an hour uh, drive, and I was free. I was really free because I didn't think about anything. I didn't bring work with me. There were other things that I didn't like about it, but this is the main thing that kind of the main difference between W2 and, and a business owner. When you're a business owner, you can find all the time in the world. The big issue is, are you emotionally available? And this is the thing that I'm still working on. So Yeah, that's challenging for sure. And I think that's the one thing that a lot of people don't recognize when they think that they want to yeah. work for themselves. They, they don't rec you know, realize <laughs> how attached they're going to be to the business and how, how much they're going to be mm -hmm. thinking about it. You know, you yep. don't, you don't clock out really. So, mm -mm. so, um, are there any tools that you use for managing your time or maybe your, not really actually. Okay. No. Or maybe like calendar or to-do list or anything like that or. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, they're not, they're mainly not managing my time, but they help me figure out what I need to do during the day. But yeah, of course, I mean, you have, um, 
you know, calendars and, and I had to block actually an hour, which I don't take the full hour, but during lunchtime, because, um, I have, you know, investors, um, that are, that, that basically register, you know, they, they sign up for, um, they book a call with me. And if I don't block parts of the days, it's just going to be back to back to back meetings. Sometimes, um, sometimes I, I speak in a week with 15 or 20 new investors and it, it really gets overwhelming. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of block some time, you know, either for myself or to do things. Um, so yeah, I mean, calendar is one of the things I'm, I'm using. Um, and I have my to-do list, which I like. I'm very tech savvy, but I like to actually write down the things I need to do because it's very satisfying to, you know. Cross it off. <laughs> erase. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's very, very satisfying. You feel very accomplished. So. Yeah, sure. Okay, good. And then um, maybe we could talk briefly about automation. Do you, what kind of things do you try to automate in your business? Everything. Everything. Um, I'm, I'm automating the... Um, you know, setting up in uh, scheduling calls with investors. So the moment they send out an email, if they go to my website, there's a form there where they leave information about themselves. And then they ask, and then basically we ask them to schedule a meeting with me. Um, and if they don't, then we reach out to them, but we're automating that process. We're automating also uh, the, the underwriting. So when we're analyzing deals, I, I'm using Airtable as I mentioned, so when there, there are three or four people involved in that process, so when, so when there's a deal coming in, you know, being added to the pipeline, then player number one makes, you know, his or her move, they're done, they mark it to the next guy so you can see the different stages um, of the deal. So each person knows when they should start, you know, working um, on a deal. So we're trying to basically automate, you know, pretty much everything. And so what kind of tools do you use for, for doing that? Um, like connecting different things together? Or... Um, so Airtable is one of them. We're also using uh, a CRM system that automates, you know, a lot of the interactions with our investors. Um, you know, if we send an email to everyone with kind of a recap of everything that I've posted on social media and all the blog posts and maybe new deals that we have, um, that's, um, that's one thing, you know, I think basically the CRM in Airtable are the main automation tools that we have. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Well, those are great suggestions. Do you have any other tips about either building, scaling, or running a syndication business? Any final thoughts? I would say, you know, don't be afraid to invest at least some money in building your company. I think it's very, you know, we're used to think that, you know, investing a lot of money in college, you know, nobody is questioning that and everyone is happy, you know, to take loans and, and to acquire higher education. And listen, I get it. I have three degrees. I, you know, I'm, I have two law degrees and an MBA. I've invested a lot in my education, but I, and I didn't think twice because I knew it, it would be a good investment. But then when people get to the point where they need to take 10 or five or two thousand dollars and invest in their growing their business there's a lot of hesitation there and you know i would say just assuming you have a little bit of money to invest feel free to bet on yourself you know this is probably going to add to your bottom line a lot more than a hundred thousand dollar fancy degree or fifty thousand dollar you know degree so um that's, that's kind of, you know, that's at least how I see things. And I wish more people would see it, you know, the, we'd see it the same way. But I think when it comes to investing in you and your business, I feel people say, I'm, you know, I want to make sure this not, this money is not going to go to waste because if I'm successful, then yeah, I have no problem. If I know I'll succeed, I have no problem investing this money. But nobody promised you to get a job after you, you know, get out of college. And yet you took the risk, you know, nevertheless. So why, why not take the risk again? I mean, what's the difference really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, great advice. Thank you. And so uh, what, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you then? So um, you can go to my website, ellieperlman.com. And Ellie is um, E-L-L-I-E. -E. Um, there's a lot of information about investing in real estate. They can download um, our free guide, um, 
or if they want to invest with me, they can, you know, leave their information there. Um, and they can also, uh, you know, leave kind of a, a generic message. I will go to um, uh, my team's inbox, but that's, you know, th these are, I think the best ways to connect with me. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate you sharing your expertise on that. Um, and uh, I'm sure it'll really benefit a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you, Todd. It was great being here today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Apartment Investor Pro podcast. Be sure to subscribe to get the latest episodes. Also, visit our website at apartmentinvestorpro.com and connect with us.